Welcome to our evening service tonight. Would you please stand? We'll sing the new song of the month, Come Quickly, Lord. All four stanzas of this new song from Chris Anderson. Creation groans beneath the load. Creation groans beneath the curse, rebellion's just reward. We long to see the fall reversed and Eden's joys restored. Come quickly, Lord, make all things new. Redeem the church, your bride. With longing eyes we look for you, for home is at your side. So weary of our traitorous flesh, of sin we hate yet crave. We yearn to seek temptation's death in dwelling sin's dark grave. Come quickly, Lord, make all things new. Redeem the church, your bride. With longing eyes, we look for you, for home is at your side. We want to hear the joyous cries and join the ransom. Worthy praise will rise from every tribe and tongue. Come quickly, Lord, make all things new. Redeem the church, your bride. <clears throat> we look for you, for home is at your side. gaze on Christ, though now our view is dim. We long for heaven's grandest prize, to see and be like him. Come quickly, Lord, make all things new. Redeem the church, your bride, with longing eyes we look for you, for home is at your side. Please remain standing for welcome and prayer. I want to welcome you. Glad that you've made it back out uh, for this evening's service. And uh, our verse of the month, uh, I'd like to go over that. It's Philippians 3, verse 20, which says, Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning in the opening verses of 1 Peter, we saw uh, one of the reasons that believers uh, can have faith and even greatly rejoice is because of that future appearing of Jesus. And uh, so we prepare for that. Would you say that verse with me, beginning with the reference? Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of uh, meeting together in your name, in your presence, and as your house today, representing the body and bride of your Son. We pray that we would approach uh, for worship in a worthy way, uh, ready to uh, magnify you, ready to uh, be uh, uh, strengthened through your word and uh, through our fellowship together. So we commit this time to you and ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be dis uh, seated. Don't be I was about to say dismissed. Or <laughs> don't get too eager for that. But um, the, any teens, you can be dismissed. The teens are meeting upstairs with uh, an apologetics group from Bob Jones University. They have special service. Uh, so I don't think they missed anybody. But if that's you, you can slip out and head up to the teen room. 
Uh, hope and pray that they'll have a good meeting. Our men's and our ladies' book study resumed this week, men on Tuesday, ladies on Thursday. And then we are just four weeks from our spring revival meetings with evangelist Mark Herbster. Hope that you're beginning to make that a matter of serious prayer. Ask God to bring visitors. Ask God to work in your heart individually and corporately as a church, that it will be a time of of spiritual awakening to God's glory and gospel and grace. And uh, I want to encourage you in the meantime to invite and get some of these cards out that you'll find on the literature table that have all of the information on there, both for the meeting place, the service times, and uh, even the live stream info on there so that uh, anyone can be able to join, hopefully, in one way or another. So make sure you're leaving those at restaurant tables and other opportunities you have to, to give those out. A couple weeks ago, uh, one of our deacons, Keith Kors, asked us to consider the challenge of passing out seven of those uh, per person. So I haven't reached my seven yet. I don't know if any of you have, but uh, let's continue to uh, spread the word and try to uh, reach some people who haven't been in church for a while or, or maybe have, have never been. Uh, we're praying for Keith and uh, especially for Mary and Sebastian. They are still up at Mayo Clinic. Uh, Marion is, is there in hopes of getting some treatment that will uh, improve his physical condition that he's lived with for these many years. Uh, many of you are aware I've been praying for Marion. On Wednesday, it looked like the door had closed. On Thursday, there was some hope, and over the weekend, they had uh, kind of an uh, initial turn down to the, the first uh, treatment plan that was proposed. But just pray that uh, they'll be able to help him there at Mayo, pray for the financial need that would be connected with any treatment that that they are able to do or even refer to another uh, hospital facility and uh, just ask God's will for Marion. Also appreciate your prayers for Ruby Roberts' brother. Uh, the Roberts were able to see him recently in Tennessee. His health is failing and he's in hospice. And so the Roberts appreciate your prayer. And one of our shut-ins, Beatrice Jekyll Bell, uh, went to the hospital. She's at St. Francis with pneumonia and uh, would appreciate your prayers, anything you can do to reach out to be an encouragement to be and uh, others that are hurting, others that are shut in, and, and those that are facing needs you know of. Let's remember them in prayer and remember to encourage them as well. One of the last invitations of our Bible, Whosoever Will May Come, let's sing that wonderful hymn, Whosoever Will. Whosoever heareth, shout, shout the sound, spread the God tidings all the world around. Tell the joyful news wherever man is found, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation over vale and hill. Tis a loving Father calls his wanderer home, whosoever will may come. Whosoever cometh need not delay, now the door is open, enter while you may. Jesus is the true, the only living way, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will, whosoever will, send their proclamation over vale and hill. Tis a loving Father called the wanderer home, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will, the promise is secure, whosoever will, forever must endure. Whosoever will, tis life forevermore, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will, whosoever will, send a proclamation over vale and hill. Tis a loving Father calls the wanderer home, whosoever will may is able to deliver thee. Again, to all three verses of this great hymn. Isn't it wonderful to find that true every day? 
Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Go by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme in the earth or main. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal strain. Tis the grandest theme, tell the world again. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest thing, let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, he will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Amen. At this time, the Stevens and Giles will come to minister before the Lord in song. Let us 
us be. Help us to be. Lord, let us be. far north end of the whole metroplex here, so pray for them as they look for the Lord's work up there and place they would have them to be. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. I was reading in um, Isaiah chapter, well, one through following chapters, but uh, there just in chapter one, my wife was sitting on the couch next to me. I'd been in that for devotion, so I came up and and she was busy doing something and reading something else herself, and I asked her if I could read to her while she read that. And uh, so uh, she said, sure. So I read that. And I got to, here am I, Lord, send me. But I said, here am I, Lord, send my wife to see if she would catch it. She did. She did. Anywhere with Jesus. Let's stand as we sing just the first two verses of that one. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go, anywhere he leads me in this world below, anywhere without him dearest joys would fade, anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid, anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over dreary ways, anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, Fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Please be seated. I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews tonight as we continue the series titled Persevere, a message that comes through consistently in this epistle uh, to hold fast to the finished faith that Jesus uh, has through His ministry uh, made available and uh, continues His ministry toward believers today. Uh, passage review, the last two times we were uh, together in this book, we looked at chapter 3 uh, verse 16 through chapter 4, 11, that passage that recalls the temptation of the Israelites in the wilderness, which they hardened their hearts uh, under in unbelief, failed to go into the promised land and God's rest. So that's a warning for us uh, to fear because hard-hearted unbelief is judged harshly. So chapter 4 opens with those words, let us therefore fear. We are to strive, however, because new-hearted belief is characterized by perseverance. So if you're saved, we ought not to uh, just rest on our leaves, but to continue to strive to enter that rest, and that's the command found uh, in verse 11, let us labor, therefore, to enter in, because God's finished work affords eternal peace, and specifically, the work of God the Son. Because we know that in the creation week, uh, Jesus was the one who was the agent of creation, who uh, brought things into existence. And so when God rested on the seventh day, Jesus was resting. And it's Jesus' finished work on the cross after which he sat down at the right hand of God. That finished work in which we rest today, even before we reach heaven, in a spiritual sense, uh, as we continue to strive, but not to earn heaven. We strive uh, because of Jesus' finished work in which we rest that enables us for service. 
Uh, the title for this evening's message as we seek to finish out the fourth chapter in verses 12 through 16 is moving from fear to boldness. That's God's desire for us. There is a command there at the starting of chapter 4 once again that we ought to fear. There's an appropriate fear because of the harsh judgment that's connected to hard-hearted unbelief. However, uh, God wants us to move from fear to boldness and we'll see how Christ's work uh, makes that available for us. Well, many are familiar with the uh, fantasy novels by J.R.R. Tolkien, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Uh, And you know that uh, in those works, like his friend C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia, Tolkien put uh, several spiritual parallels intentionally. Uh, But one of his lesser known works is called uh, The Farmer Giles of Ham. And it's a short story about a farmer. Farmer Giles of Ham is, is a farmer who is not brave or heroic, uh, but in the story, which is another fantasy novel set in medieval times, a giant comes to uh, Farmer Giles of Ham's farm. And uh, though he is not brave or heroic, Giles mounts his plow horse and rides out to meet the giant carrying a blunderbuss musket and fires a shot in the giant's general direction and uh, is able to scare him away. Well, the townsfolk hear about this and make Giles of Ham a hero. Word of this reaches the king of the region, and the king seeks to honor the quasi-heroic farmer Giles and uh, awards to him an ancient sword that he dug out of the armory, a, a large and cumbersome weapon that was uh, outdated, but uh, as the story goes, uh, turns out it belonged to Giles' uh, great, great, great grandfather four generations back, who was the bravest dragon slayer of all. Well, Farmer Giles is not very impressed with this sword. He prefers his blunderbuss musket, and so he hides it away in a kitchen cabinet and cabinet and continues to go about his business. Well, one day a parson comes to the farm and asks to see that weapon that he had heard about. And as Farmer Giles takes it out of the cabinet, he is surprised to find that it is out of its sheath. And uh, it is apparent that this sword possesses magical capabilities. And he tries to put it back in the sheath, but it refuses to go in. Well, the parson is able to decipher some ancient uh, lettering on the sheath. Uh, that reveals that this sword refuses to be sheathed if a dragon is within five miles of it. And so uh, Giles knows a dragon is coming. The king gets word and musters his bravest knights and uh, decrees that uh, Farmer Giles, since he is a heroic giant fighter after all, is to go along with the expedition. All the knights uh, are defeated and those who survive uh, come back unable to make any Uh, progress in defeating or even scaring away the dragon. Uh, But the dragon is in for a surprise when the farmer wielding this sword called Kadimarax rides out on his plow horse and from Kadimarax a bright light shines and blinds the dragon. And then even in the hand of the untrained farmer, this sword slashes and wounds the dragon who soon realizes that he won't be able to terrorize this village as long as one bearing this sword is around. Not only is Giles able to scare off the dragon, but he successfully coerces the beast into taking his treasure hoard from his cave and bringing it for the townspeople to share, and they all live happily ever after. Well, Hebrews chapter 4 And verse 12, one of the better known and beloved verses of the New Testament, a verse that describes the Bible itself, one that you've likely committed to memory, goes this way. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And like Farmer Giles, you and I were ordinary people. I'm neither brave nor heroic. I'm not uh, trained in battle and uh, certainly can't uh, fight the old serpent that besets us 
in the present world. Uh, but we have a sword, an ancient weapon that has been preserved and passed down to us uh, against which the old serpent cowers and flees and kneels and submits. And so uh, this word, uh, let's not keep it in the cabinet. Let's not keep it in a shelf. Let's not keep it in a sheath, for the devil is always near, uh, prowling about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we ought to be uh, bearers of the word, faithfully reading and digesting and committing to memory and studying and applying God's word in our lives. What a precious weapon it is. Uh, God's Word is given uh, five descriptors here in verse 12, and we'll list those. It is living, that's the word quick, means that God's Word is not uh, an ancient dusty scroll that uh, is a relic of history, though it is ancient and though it is historic, it is alive. Uh, Jesus uh, is God's mediator of revelation to us today. Chapter 1 and verse 2 says that God has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. In chapter 2, the opening verses make it clear that that speaking to us through Jesus is accomplished by the ministry of the apostles, which was confirmed by signs and wonders and miracles. Even as they wrote this inspired word, God has preserved it for us. And as we interact with it, it is alive and it can speak to us. It can transform us. It can illuminate as the Spirit opens our eyes to understand its truth. It is powerful. Uh, the verse says it's quick and powerful. That's a word that refers to its activity. It is active. It is energetic. It is not resting. It uh, has power. Uh, and God's Word can break the chains of sin. God's Word can help us to resist temptation hiding it in our hearts that we might not sin against God. God's Word can warn us so that we would not go the way that draws us uh, by its allures but ends in destruction. It's powerful. Uh, and we're reminded of Jesus in the wilderness during His temptation, quoting Scripture to defeat the devil's schemes. Verse 12 says that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, so God's Word is sharp. It is piercing, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And it is a discerner. God's Word is discerning as it penetrates the hearts of those who will read it ready to see God's truth. It's possible to read God's Word with a hard heart and for your heart not to be penetrated as you read, but to read with any kind of faith, to read with any kind of submission and openness to God's message uh, will result in the piercing and discerning sharpness being felt in our lives. Well, verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 4 is often clung to as a verse to give us courage. We think of ourselves as sword wielders uh, in keeping with Paul's uh, instruction to the Ephesians in chapter 6 of his letter to them in which he says, take the sword of the Spirit, and he's referring to God's Word, the Bible. And certainly, uh, we can gain uh, an encouragement in that regard from verse 12. Indeed, as we think about the fact that that descriptor and those words you see on the screen behind me and in your Bibles in verse 12, those descriptors are true of every part of your Bible. That from Genesis to Revelation, that God's Word is alive and powerful, and it's endued with that spiritual power from God. Those original manuscripts in Greek and Hebrew, translations enjoyed and studied all over the world, our brothers and sisters reading a Japanese translation across the world, a Spanish translation down in Mexico, or a Russian translation over in Ukraine, reading God's living and powerful Word that is impactful for us in our lives. However, as we study this verse and the next few verses, it becomes clear that really the writer of Hebrews is not intending to make us brave and courageous wielders of this sword primarily, but these verses are actually intended for us to 
uh, really take consideration of the way this sword cuts toward us. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, and it can be used on the offensive against the devil's attacks. But it is also the scalpel that God uses in our lives to cut away the exterior and to divide in to the deep recesses of our souls, our spirits, of our thoughts and our intents in our hearts and to expose anything that is not in keeping with the instruction that it gives. When it says that it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, what does that mean? How do you divide the soul from the spirit? Well, theologians try to, and we can write and preach and study and argue about whether man is a two-part being having soul and body, or, whether he, or spirit and body, or whether he is a three-part being having body and soul and spirit, all three of those terms the Bible uses. And so you can believe in two parts and call yourself a dichotomist, or believe in three parts and call yourself a trichotomist and engage in friendly banter over which uh, the Bible teaches. Uh, again, all three of those terms are used. At times they seem interchangeable. And what's the difference between the soul and the spirit? And I think that's kind of the writer's point, that if there is any distinction at all, it's infinitesimal that we are, uh, in a real way, splitting hairs when we divide between soul and spirit. And yet the Bible does that. It cuts to the deepest part of us spiritually. If we will read it, study it, and do so with a soft and submissive heart. It uh, divides asunder or cuts apart soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow. That if you cut through the several layers of your skin, there are muscles and muscle tissue and blood vessels and you continue to cut and there are uh, ligaments and, and uh, other things in there that uh, we don't care to think about very often. And you get all the way down to the bone. You think you've reached the deepest physical part of our uh, human self, and yet within the bone is that marrow, and in the joints as the bone were even to be broken apart in even deeper than the bone, uh, the sword of God's Word divides sharper than any two-edged sword between the deepest physical recesses of our being, joints and marrow, and the deepest spiritual elements of our being, the soul and spirit. And so, I uh, start with a challenge that if you're not consistently reading God's Word, studying it, allowing it to impact you, there are things, there are realities, patterns, thoughts, feelings, beliefs inside of you that are infectious and festering and need to be cut out. And if you are reading Scripture, and most of us know very personally what it is to read a verse or a passage and to feel it cut into us in that way. But if you are reading Scripture and you're not experiencing that piercing conviction, ask God to soften your heart. Ask Him to help you to read with open eyes, with open ears, with a submissive spirit that's ready to be rebuked and corrected and convicted by His Word. Harkening back to the words of chapter 3, today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart. Our kids, uh, I took to the dentist a few weeks ago and as the dental hygienists are working on uh, Jade's teeth and Esther's teeth and Levi's teeth, they ask questions like, uh, are there any problems, any pain, any loose teeth left, and how often are you brushing? He said, make sure that you brush in the evening is most important, but they ought to be brushing in the morning too. Two brushes a day at minimum is important. But then the hygienist, uh, one of them admitted, she said, I'm having a hard time getting my kids to brush in the morning. 
And the reason, she said, the kids come up with excuses and they say, Mom, I have to wear a mask to school anyway. No one's going to see my teeth or know if my uh, mouth is dirty. So uh, since I'm wearing a mask, I don't need to brush my teeth in the morning. And um, maybe some of you have uh, came across that uh, same scapegoat. You realize, well, I might not need to bother shaving today, so I'm going to be wearing a mask when I'm out in public. Or maybe it doesn't matter so much about the makeup and the other things because uh, I'll be wearing a mask. And You know, a mask can cover up your faults and can shield you from the discerning eyes of others who might otherwise uh, observe your flaws. Uh, But when God examines us, And when the scalpel or the sword of Scripture is applied, all of those masks, all of those coverings, all of those facades are cut away. And so, um, three points tonight. We're half done, uh, even though we've made it through uh, verse 12 here. Let's read verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And the reference, him with whom we have to do, the one to whom we must give account, is a reference to our just judge, God the Father. So the first point this evening, even though, as I say, we're, we're over half done here, revere the judge because of your record. Revere the judge when we think about all being exposed in his sight and his word, cutting away the facades and the excuses, even as for the Israelites, in that Numbers 14 generation that didn't have the faith to enter the promised land, they had their rationalizations, they had their excuses. The inhabitants of the city are too big, they're too many, they're too strong, they have advanced weaponry, they have better military training, they're fortified, we better leave. Let's pick a new leader. Let's go back to Egypt. And all of their excuses. And while everyone else is doing it, no one else wants to go in. We must just be safest by going the way that seems right to us. But none of those excuses was the true reason that they did not enter. As God's Word cut through all of that rationalization, all of those excuses and scapegoats, and facades, and masks, the true reality that kept them from entering was a hard heart of unbelief, unwilling to cling to the truth that God had revealed to them. I wonder if anyone here has uh, had the experience in an earthly court of standing before a judge. Not for uh, something pleasant like... uh, I'm not talking about standing before someone who would marry uh, you and your spouse or something like that, but maybe you've uh, been summoned to court for a violation of some kind. Or maybe if you haven't experienced that, you've at least been called to the principal's office or uh, to the dean's office. Or at least likely you've had a police officer, a boss, a parent, some figure of authority uh, sit you down behind a closed door and ask an intimidating question like, tell me exactly what happened. And as you've been in those situations, you know what it feels like? That there is a, a rush of adrenaline and anxiety. We try to think through, first to make sure we have our story straight. Second, to make sure that we can, though being honest, we hope, uh, we certainly must insist, to present ourselves and our story, our account, our side of things in a way that will be palatable, pleasing, help us to find favor uh, in the eyes of the one who uh, makes the judgment. So we don't show up to court late, wearing pajamas and in messed up hair. No, we're there looking our best and our best outward appearance, putting our best foot forward hoping that even if we are guilty, that we make a good enough impression, that we present our case well enough, that we present our excuses and rationalization and reasoning in such a way that the judge might be lenient. Well, as we stand before a judgment for spiritual matters, I want us, I think this will be a helpful exercise. Let's imagine for just a couple more minutes You stand not before a judge for a traffic violation or something of that nature. 
but that you are being spiritually judged based on uh, your faithfulness to the Lord or imagining. How do you enter that appointment? I think most of us, we have rationalized our own decisions and behaviors to the extent that we probably would feel, though we would squirm in such a situation, fairly confident that we could give satisfactory answers that would get us out of there somewhat unscathed. As we notch that up a level, imagine it's not a judge, but the spiritual mentors in your life at that judgment bar. And it's revealed that a warrant has been issued spiritually that has given access to your phone, to your computer, to your TV, to your internet modem. Not only that, but cameras and microphones have been planted in your home and workplace and car for the last six months so that all of your behavior, all of your words and actions would be exposed to be judged by those spiritual leaders. If you can imagine yourself in that setting, as I imagine myself in that setting, there would certainly be some squirming and some discomfort. And for some of us, that would even be a devastating experience. But maybe there are a few here who, even through something like that, as you think through your life, you would maybe still come out of that okay. So I want to ratchet that experience up infinitesimal levels, as you imagine now, not a panel of spiritual mentors, but God, the divine and just judge. And as you stand before him for a spiritual judgment, not only are your words and actions and entertainment and media choices exposed, but the thoughts and motivations and inner feelings and intentions behind those words and actions is now exposed before the gazing eye of that judge. How does that feel? That Though the video showed me dropping a gift in the offering plate, that God's piercing gaze saw that that was given not out of generous love and worship, but out of a sense of spiritual duty, begrudgingly, resentfully, or perhaps selfishly expecting some earthly return, or perhaps arrogantly uh, feeling a sense of pride as I have, I have, as I have accomplished this uh, task of worship or devotion, or perhaps a, a selfishness as we consider that others might see or, or that the treasurers might know uh, that I'm giving. Or even as I open God's Word and the video shows that and I look good before others, that God sees the heart of one who desires to gain merit by performing a spiritual ritual so that I might feel better about myself on that day having done what preachers and teachers have told me I ought to do to be a good spiritual believer. Such a judgment, as devastating as those human judgments might be, is eternally condemning. And so it is appropriate and healthy for us to squirm, yea, to quake in fear as we think about that momentarily. I think the writer of Hebrews unfolds it in such a way, and the Holy Spirit has preserved it in such a way in this order for us to be in that position and to dangle there for a moment, squirming under that gaze, revere the judge, because of your record. But praise God we don't stay with that image. The second point is hold fast your profession because of your high priest. Read verse 13 one more time. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Then he moves on and says, seeing then, hearkening back to all of this line of argument from chapters 3 through 4, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. And here's the next exhortation. You see in 
chapter 4 and verse 1, let us therefore fear. In verse 11, let us labor. Here's the next command. It comes in verse 14. Seeing that Jesus has passed through this life, he did so in a sinless way. He was killed. He was buried. He was resurrected. He ascended and went back into the heavenly places and is seated at the right hand of God. Here is the command, let us hold fast our profession. We compare it back to chapter 3 and verse 1. Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful. And because of Jesus earthly ministry, his earthly perfection, his sinless life and sacrifice, he ascended into the holiest of holies, is our great high priest. And so what does it mean to hold fast to our profession? Or chapter 3, verse 1, to consider the high priest of our profession. It is your profession of saving faith. If you claim to be a Christian tonight, your confession of Jesus Christ as Savior, your profession of faith in Him as a believer is something that you must cling to because Jesus' ministry as a high priest is essential for us as we stand before the divine and just judge God the Father. For we have, verse 15, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched, with the feeling of our infirmities, of our weaknesses. But we don't have that kind of a judge that can't sympathize, that can't empathize, that can't be touched with the feeling of our weaknesses. But we have this kind of high priest, one who was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. And so chapters 1 and 2 of this epistle tell us about Jesus' ministry for us as our prophet. A prophet is one who brings God's word to God's people or to people in general. He is our apostle, chapter 3 and and verse 1. He brings God's word to us and he does so in a way that is more magnificent than the way in which the angels brought the old covenant to man. And all of chapter 1 and 2 uh, lays out that argument. All of chapters 3 and 4 is to present our need for a high priest because we as humans have hard hearts and so easily drift away from faithfulness to God. And so if we are to persevere before the judge who sees all, the judge before whom all are uncovered and exposed to the very depths of our physical and spiritual being, that we need this high priest. And so, go back to that image that you had in your mind a moment ago with God, the divine and just judge, sitting at the judge's bar, and you standing before him completely exposed, not only your words and actions, but all of the thoughts and intentions and motivations behind those words and actions. And add to that mental picture a second figure at that judge's bar, and seated there at the right hand of God, is God the Son, our great high priest. And though God the Father is experientially estranged from all of our sinful experience, God the Father, Habakkuk chapter 1 says, is of purer eyes than to behold evil. Sin cannot be near him. In fact, he even had to turn his back on his own son Jesus Christ as he bore your sins and mine on the cross because he is completely estranged from any experiential exposure to sin and temptation. But Jesus Christ, though sinless, felt that pull, experienced that temptation, felt the physical weakness of being human. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be tired. He knows what it is to be rejected, to be ignored, to be mocked, to be called names, to grow up in a mixed family, to be misunderstood. He knows. And in fact, when the Bible tells us that he was tempted in all points like as we are, Sometimes when we think about the temptation of Jesus and wonder how effective he is as a high priest for us, a mediator between us and the divine judge, 
We think about that temptation in the wilderness, a temptation that's kind of hard to relate to. You and I, we aren't tempted to turn stones to bread. We aren't tempted to throw ourselves from the highest turret of a city. I dare say we aren't tempted to bow down before the devil and worship him. Yet we understand, don't we, that that 40-day window that culminated in that temptation was not the extent of Jesus' earthly temptation. That Jesus growing and living an earthly life from infancy to my age experienced all of the things that we experience in terms of temptation, yet he never sinned. He was tempted his whole earthly life. Kids, did you know that Jesus experienced the pull, the temptation of sin to uh, behave toward his parents in a disrespectful way? Jesus never did that. He never entertained that thought. However, that category of temptation was truly applied to him. That the temptation to cover up your actions from your parents, that the temptation to tell a lie, that the temptation to go along with what your friends are doing that you know is not right, not just for kids, that all of the temptations that a young adult is exposed to and growing up in the world trying to be holy feels the pull and sees the attraction of and has the physical cravings that human bodies have, Jesus is not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our weakness. He was tempted in every point like as we are. Now again, I want to emphasize that Jesus never entertained those thoughts towards sin. That he was never uh, even leaning toward making a decision that would have been sinful. And yet his temptation was legitimate. It was the same as ours. And in fact, he endured more temptation than we. If you think about the devil and our flesh and the world turning up the pressure to sin on our lives. And if temptation could be measured on a scale from 1 to 10. And as we go through life, our flesh and the world and the devil gradually turn up the pressure to one, to two, to three. And by this time, many of us have already broken, have already bent to that pressure. To four, to five. And by the time you get to six, none of us still standing pure against the temptation to sin. Jesus experienced that temptation far beyond the point that any of us ever have endured and continue to be faithful, and he was without sin. It was ranked and, and cranked, excuse me, up to 10 in the wilderness, 40 days without food, desperate for food. His body craved that food. Kneeling in the Garden of Gethsemane as sweat drops, as great drops of blood, oozed from his pores as he considered the weight of the decision to follow and submit to God's will. And he was faithful. He never sinned. And yet, we take some comfort in the fact that nothing that entices you is foreign to Jesus. He was tempted in all points like as we are. And so we hold fast to our profession because of our high priest. He is the one that stands between us and the just judge. And so as Jesus represents us before God the Father, God looks on us and his exposing gaze, rather than viewing our sin, sees the blood of his son that covers that sin, that has paid its penalty, that has uh, provided propitiation so that there is no more outstanding crime on our account. No sin that has yet to be dealt with and God sees us as his children and as Jesus' siblings. And so we revere the judge, and because of that reverence, we hold fast to our profession of Jesus the high priest, and finally, we boldly approach for help because of Jesus' record. Verse uh, 16, Let us therefore Come boldly. And that word come is a word that we could say draw nigh or approach. It's a word that the writer will use several times throughout the book to speak of 
drawing near to God's presence for worship and service and communion. Let us therefore draw nigh. And here's the next imperative, the next command. We had let us fear, let us labor, let us hold fast. And now in verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that is God's judgment throne, God's ruling and reigning throne, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So that now as we face temptation, instead of trying to bear that temptation and defeat that temptation by our own strength, by our own resolve, so that God might not be angry, so that God might be impressed by our performance. Instead, we say, this is too much for me. I can't bear up to this under my own strength and my sinful self, though I'm saved, that flesh continues to corrupt and pull me toward this sin. I don't have the strength to do right. And so I come boldly to the throne where I can find grace, where I can find mercy, where I can find help in that time of need, that I never need to sin, that there is no temptation that ever takes me, but such as is common to man and God is faithful and will with the temptation also make a way of escape so that you can be able to bear it. The way of escape is the judgment throne of God where we go to our high priest who sits at his right hand and find grace to help in time of need. Turn to him when temptation pulls you toward that which is wrong. Hold fast to your profession when the world allures you toward that which God forbids, when your own flesh and laziness and longings and desires would cause you to go in a direction that is drifting away from God's demands for your life. Run to Him. Turn to the throne. Come boldly to the throne seeking grace and help in time of need. In time of temptation, and that time of need is at times when we have fallen and we have sinned, And we go before that throne looking for mercy. That's our grace to help in time of need is sometimes when we're tempted and we're trying so hard not to sin. Sometimes it's when we've failed and we've sinned. And we know that if any man sin, he has an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. It doesn't mean that we continue in sin, that grace may abound, saying if I sin, it's okay. Jesus is there. His blood covers it. He will cover for me. Instead, it motivates us to righteousness, and when we sin, it motivates us to a quick, a speedy, and a full repentance. We come before God, and we confess, and we repent, and we forsake it, and we cast it on the shoulders of our high priest, and we go our way forgiven and cleansed to do right. One preacher compared it this way, and I'll close with this. It's like the teenager who totals the family car And one way to come home from that accident is to say, I know that mom and dad are going to kill me. I'll never drive again. In fact, I may never leave my room again because I've blown it. That's man's position before God without the ministry of Jesus Christ. With the ministry of Jesus Christ, it's as if that teenager heads home, instead with this attitude. Wow, I am so sorry that that happened, and I wish like anything that I could make it right, that I could make it better. But I know that mom and dad will understand. I know that they will be sensitive and sympathetic. And that's the word in verse 15, to be touched. It's the Greek word, sympatheo, the idea that Jesus knows what it feels like to be weak physically and to be tempted spiritually. And he understands. He doesn't overlook it. He doesn't excuse it. It cost him his blood. But he makes a way for us to have that forgiveness and cleansing both in this life and eternally. Praise God for our high priest, And so we picture ourselves as we did in verse 13, quaking and squirming and shaking in our boots under the gaze of the judge. And now just two verses later, we picture ourselves instead coming boldly before that throne, seeking help and mercy and grace. What's the difference between the quaking and the boldness? 
It's the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's what you and I rely on for our eternal security and what you and I must run to for our daily struggle against sin because God's desire for us is that we would persevere and to hold fast to that confession and to live in a way that pleases Him. Let's pray and ask for His help in this. Lord, we thank You, we praise You for our High Priest, Your Son, who You gave in Your love, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Though Your judgment is just, against those who reject Jesus Christ. We, your people, thank you and praise you for your mercy and grace that allows you to suspend judgment against us because of your wrath poured out on Jesus. So, Lord, we run to him. We draw near. We approach your presence, not cowering and quaking, with a healthy reverence, yet coming boldly, not because of our record, because of the sinless record of Jesus who knows our need and understands our weakness and helps us in the time of need. May we never try to go it alone. May we never try to impress you by doing it by ourselves. May we rest in the finished work of Jesus and come quickly to him when we need that help. In Jesus' name, we ask you to bless us in this. Amen. Our invitation closing song of the evening is a little out of the ordinary, but one of the great anthems of our faith. Faith, it's a song of victory, and can it be? So let's stand as we sing this this evening. We'll sing just the first and the last. And if the Lord lays upon your heart to come and claim that victory and find grace to help in the nick of time, and you want to come and pray to do that as we sing, please feel free to do so. And can it be? that I should gain and be in trust in the Savior's blood. Died he for me who caused his pain for me who him to death pursued. close with that great benediction from Proverbs 13 and a great blessing to us if we will take it. And now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, perfect you, make you complete, equip you in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. And all of God's people said... Amen.